My name's Chris Hilkin. I'm from San Diego. I have five kids. That's a lot, right? Yeah. Okay, stop your judgment. He looks too young. Okay, um, in, uh, I was at a church up in North County, and one day I got like a little request. Like as a, as a pastor, you have like the, the great honor to be with people on like their best days, and then you also are with people a lot of times on, on their worst days. And so I got an email and it said, there's this, one, there's this woman, Judith, that goes to this church, and she wants someone to do a funeral for her stepmom. And so this kind of came across my desk, and I was the pastor on call that week. That means I'm in charge of all of the marriages and all of the funerals and everything else that needs to happen. So uh, she comes into the office, and I'm going to meet with her, and she's like, she's a little bit off. You know what, like when you meet, you meet someone, and you're like, you're... You're just slightly bizarre. You're just not quite all there. She had like a big cat on her shirt. Her shirt was stained with like Pepsi and she thought that like Obama had ruined the world. She just kept saying Obama over and over. I didn't, I didn't know why. She's like, Obama. So she was just, you know what I mean? You just, like, I, you just, there's something a little bit twisted. So I'm talking to her and she's like, well, you're a part of a big church. I'm sure that you're not gonna do anything personal. And so I was like, you know what? Why don't we do this? why don't you tell me everything that I should know about your mom? And so she does. So for the next hour and a half, she walks me through everything about her mom. Her mom's a bowler. Her mom was uh, military. Her mom was, um, loved Dale Earnhardt Jr. So I've got these like pages and pages of notes. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to make this so personalized, she's not going to believe it. So I show up to Mira Mesa National Cemetery. It's like a full honors funeral, okay, because of the, the military nature of her family. And uh, there's like a, it's supposed to be like this salute to her, and there's like the, the color. Uh, there's so many ways to respect and honor this woman who has passed away. And the funeral starts at 12. The, the color guard's supposed to be there at 12, 15. So I've got 15 minutes to blow these people's minds with how personal this whole thing is going to be. So I start and I say, you know what, guys, today it's perfectly reasonable to be human. You know, today you might want to cry. That's okay. Today you might want to laugh. And guess what? That's okay. Too. Don't get ahead of me. That's okay too. Okay. And as I'm saying this, this lady in the front row raised her hand and I went, uh, I don't understand what's going on. And, and so I start talking and I start saying, well, well let me finish. Today you're gonna laugh because you might think of the time that you went bowling and uh, she just cleaned your clock in a good game of bowling. Or maybe you're, you're gonna laugh because you'll think of the time that you sat down with her on the couch and watched Dale Earnhardt Jr. win one of his races. There's a lot of reasons you could laugh today. And then this woman got my attention and she said, you're talking about Brenda. And I said, that's right. I am talking about Brenda. And Brenda's a woman today that we remember for, and then the lady raised her hand again. And I said, yes. She said, that's Sandy. I said, what? She said, you're talking about Brenda. The woman in the casket is Sandy. This is the truest story I could tell you, okay? So I start thinking to myself, and I want you to put yourself in my shoes, because the next question is, what are you supposed to do now? So I start replaying everything in my brain. Where, <laughs> have you ever done a funeral for the wrong person before? Probably not. There's really nowhere to go from here. And so I started processing, and I went, where did I go wrong? So I'm going back to the very beginning, and I'm, what, what happened? And I remember when the email first came in, it said, this woman named Judith would like you to do a funeral for her stepmom. So I sat down with her in a room, and I said, tell me all about your mom. mom. So guess what she did? For an hour and a half, she told me all about her living, estranged, Family can't stand her mother who lives in Florida who wasn't even invited to Sandy's funeral. So I literally got up at Sandy's funeral and I eulogized and honored a woman who was such an enemy of the family that she wasn't even invited to. So, and here's the other problem. What do I know about Sandy? Nothing. 
So I'm standing here at Mira Mesa National Cemetery with nothing else to do. I'm two minutes in to what's supposed to be a 15 minute long funeral. And I literally had to say, does anyone want to say anything about Sandy? And so like one guy stood up and he was old and he was mean. And he was like, well, Sandy. I'm like, okay, Bill, I get it. I did the, okay, whatever. (laughs) You know, he's super old. Okay. But I didn't have anything else to say. So the funeral was five minutes long. And I, then we started walking away. And then here comes the color guard in to honor her. But I had already released everyone to go back to their cars and to drive home. It was literally the worst possible moment that you could imagine. In the life of being a pastor, right? Someone who, you do this on a fairly regular basis between marrying people and burying people. There was a moment where I thought, how costly is a single word like step? Most of us would think, most of the time, we're not, we're not going to have a situation in our life where a single word is extremely costly. But today, as we kind of enter into this conference, I'm going to read from you a passage from Scripture where Jesus interacts with a man that the Bible's going to call a rich young ruler. We want to kind of tease out this idea of what does it mean for those of us who are sitting here today, and you come from a multiplicity of backgrounds, okay? Some of you... Do not care. This, this part of the conference is going to be the worst part for you because you don't care about God. You don't believe in God. You hate God. You've rejected God. You think that people who follow God are hate-filled. You think they're judgmental. You think they're hypocritical. You have taken to yourself in your life, and you're adults at this point. You can make decisions for yourself. And as for you and your heart, you're not going to be a God kind of person. You just don't want anything to do with it. Some of you have been hurt by people who profess faith in God. Some of you come from a household that's extremely religious, and you've watched your parents in divorce, in abuse, in drunken stupors, in drug use. And so you have this really strange view of why are people so enraptured with the idea of God, but they don't really live it out. Some of you are sitting here and you're like the homeschooled, you know every Bible verse like the back of your hand, like you regularly just open the Bible to see how fast you can find Romans chapter three and you have, you know, it's like your thing, it's like your favorite thing and you probably go to your local youth group and there's an element in which when you think about God, God is something that you accomplish, right? God's not really someone that you worship. God isn't someone that you revel in and find beautiful and, 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 and find phenomenal. It's, it's like a, it's a school subject to you. Or maybe you go to a Christian school and you have to learn about Jesus. It's one of your classes. And so God has ceased to be anything other than a letter grade to you or something nerdy that you can judge your friends that you're better than them because you know more about God than the next person. There's others of you that are genuinely curious on this whole God thing. And, and, and here's the issue, I think that for the majority of us, here's the the realm that we walk into this morning. The white noise of teenage culture that we live in today is so loud, and if you don't slow down your brain for a conference like this, or slow down a morning for a conversation about God-type things, you're gonna wake up tomorrow and you're gonna be 40, and you'll never have processed the really big questions of life that actually matter. You might have a lot of followers on social media. You might be really important in your friends group. You might have more girlfriends than you know what to do with. You might have had more relational experiences. But if I was really to sit down with you, there's something so core to you that feels empty. And so you just kind of go day to day trying to seek to fulfill something in your spirit. And the more that you try and the more followers you have and the more things that you buy and the more the, the, the newer upgrade of the phone that you have, there's, there's something that you know that I know. Nothing is working for you. In a span of the last 15 years where technology has basically gone from being something for the rich and elite to something that's in every single one of our pockets, there was this great promise that while we're able to connect to each other easier and while we're able to see what people are doing and what they're eating and get invested in their life more, our lives are going to be more fulfilled. We're going to feel like we have more friends. We're going to be more connected to each other. And in that same period of time, the last 15 years, the odds of someone your age committing suicide has gone up 100%. 
and our culture is putting Jesus on the wayside, and we used to be much more religious. We used to have much more to do with God in our culture. We used to be all about him, both as a nation and in, and in the way that we lived our home lives, and there's this idea of progression that's taken place both in our culture and in our homes and in your schools and in our country that's moving away from God and we're considering it progress and yet when you're looking at the way that we live our lives, the confusion of being, the political unrest, the brokenness that you experience in your own heart, the, the rampant rates of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and self-harms, no one sitting here, if you open your eyes for more than two minutes, thinks that things are going well. You couldn't stand in front of me and make a case that the world is doing good. But if you don't slow down and ask the question, you are just going to have this white noise of culture for the next 60 years until you close your eyes in death and none of the reality of what's important in your life is ever gonna strike you. What does good mean? Are you a good person? Are you living your life well? What happens after you die? Is hell a real place? Is heaven a real place? Is there judgment coming? Is there a God out there? Does what I do matter to anyone? Is it, is it relevant to anyone outside of my own sphere that I'm even here anymore? If I was gone, would the world be better? And we've kind of taken this numbing pill of our culture where you can at all times and in all situations be fixated on a screen or on the people around you that the, what happens then is instead of dealing with those hard questions about your loneliness, your brokenness, your hurt, your depression, your anxiety, and the real questions of life, you instead consistently feed yourself on a healthy diet of social media and the white noise of culture so you don't have to deal with it. And moments come up like a conference like this, and it really is a godsend for all of us, especially living in San Diego, California. Y'all, I've taught at conferences in Iowa, and people are geeked out because they get to go outside. They're like, yeah, we get to go to a conference. But you live in San Diego. You've got other things to see. You've got other places to be. You've got, right now, the, the number of things that you could participate in are just multiplicitous. Why, what are you doing here? And if you don't force yourself to ask the big life questions, you are gonna fall in line with the rest of all of culture that is slowly moving themselves towards destruction. And this is why the Bible comes in clutch. And no matter what you wanna say about Christianity or Jesus or religious belief systems or whatever it is, I can tell you one thing. As we have gotten rid of God and the conversation surrounding belief and faith and soul and eternity, our culture has gotten significantly and unanimously worse. So even if you're opposed to it, you have to admit that this is not the way that things should be. And if there's something in your heart that says there's a better way of being out there, where are you getting that idea from? If you think culture's not going well, if you think your life isn't being lived the way it's supposed to, you naturally are inclined to think that there's another way of doing things. And it might be easy for you to look at me and go, look, he's a 34-year-old guy. He's got five kids. He's living the American dream. Let me walk you into my world a little bit to explain to you why I think these questions have such pertinence in our culture today. Two years ago, my fifth child was born. Her name is Finley. Finley's just my little pride and joy. My wife, Paige, started having back pains at, right, so, shortly after she was she was born and we didn't really know what those were. So we ended up going to the hospital and Paige was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism, which means a blood clot on your lungs. This pulmonary embolism almost killed her. So that night when we were supposed to go to sleep, Paige stayed up all night. And then she stayed up for the next night. And then she stayed up for the next night. And then she stayed up for the next night. And my wife didn't sleep for 10 nights in a row. She didn't sleep at all for 10 nights in a row. Now, if you know anything about sleep or the sleep process, if you take food, water, and sleep away from someone, sleep will almost always kill them first. And if it doesn't kill them, it will leave their brain fundamentally rewired and broken. And this is what happened to my wife. She came, and we were having conversations, and we were doing life together. And then all of a sudden, through the course of these series of really messed up, weird events, 
My wife, who would never struggle with anxiety, never struggle with depression, never struggle with anxious thoughts, suicidal ideation, was all of a sudden telling me that she felt like something inside of her was telling her to kill herself. Which, as a pastor, you sit, and some of us, we have this idea of, of this is who God should be in our life, right? Like, if you're a good person, God's going to protect you. He's going to nerf ball your life, right? He's going to bubble wrap you, and he's going to make sure that you're secure. But anyone in here who follows Jesus knows that's not the truth. So if you've been pitched this idea that if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be simple and it's going to be protected, you know that I need, I'm here to tell you this is completely wrong. So we start trying to figure out ways to fix this situation. And one of the doctors says, um, you need to, to, to get Paige back in a scenario where she can live life normally and get her away from trauma. So he diagnosed with PTSD, schizophrenic um, tendencies, and, and, and split personality. And so they said, in order to get her well, she needs to do a lot of therapy, but we have to remove trauma from her life. That's what he said. He said, one thing is you've got to get trauma out of her life. Well, the next week I was supposed to teach at Hume Lake Christian Camps. So I, Paige and I and all the kids, we get in a van and we head up there. And on night two, I'm presenting the gospel. And my son, Leo, uh, falls over like he's dead. And no one understands why. So we go and we try to understand what's going on. The, my, whole, my, my wife, in her sleeplessness, had her sleeping pills out. And we believed at the time that he had taken a whole bottle of my wife's sleeping pills. So we're up on the mountain and they say, we can't life flight your kid out of here. If this is what happens, there's, this is what happened, there's nothing we can do. He said, get in your van. We're going to go as fast as we can down the mountain, but it's a two and a half hour drive to the nearest hospital. They said, Christopher, as you're following, keep your distance because if we have to pull over and resuscitate your son, I want to make sure you don't run to the back of the ambulance while we're pulling him out. Now you can come to these moments in your life where you think to yourself, right? This is an easy moment to, to just sit and yell and think like, God, why don't you do something? Like, I, I think you've probably been here, even if you don't believe in God. If you're sitting in this room and you don't believe in God, you're among company in here. You're not the only one here who doesn't believe. But even as Christians, you can stumble across these moments where you think to yourself, God, why don't you do something, right? And it seems like, a, it's, for me, it seems like a pretty rudimentary request, right? Like, my wife, get her better, and then my son, who's currently unresponsive, do something, like intervene. If you're the great physician, then do great physician-like things. Bring him back, bring her back, bring back my wife, bring back my life, bring back my son. Change my circumstances. And I'm following this ambulance down this hill, I'm just like yelling out in my car, because I'm, I'm just beyond angry. So we get down the mountain, we get into the hospital, they end up testing Leo. He's got acute onset cerebralitis, which is this really rare infection that occurs on the onset of, a, of another type of disease. But essentially, after three days, he's back up and he's totally fine. But in the moment, when we were down in that place thinking that our son had lost his life, I looked over at my wife and I remembered what the doctor said. The doctor gave me one objective, keep her away from trauma. And instead of keeping her away from trauma, she was introduced to the most horrifying thing that a mom can ever be introduced to, which is, what if your son dies in your arms? So we go back home and, and we try these different therapies and everything, and one day I'm sitting next to her and we're sitting on the side of our house together and we're discussing things, and she was having these episodes, these like schizophrenic, psychotic episodes, and there was like, it, we tried everything. We tried medicine and therapy and, and um, EDM, all these different ways of doing things. And, and one day I'm sitting next to her and, and she ends up just jumping off the balcony from the second floor to the, to the first floor of our house right, and lands right next to our newborn baby. And I'm just thinking, what in the world is going on? Like psychotic behavior. Because of the sleeplessness, it's she, her brain that was supposed to self-preserve, it was telling, there was something in her brain telling her that she needed to kill herself. So I get online and I, I just figure out like what's the best treatment center in the nation. There's this place in, in Tucson, Arizona. And so we, that night we get on a plane and we fly out there and my whole community is freaking out, right? My family's freaking out. All my friends are freaking out. There's prayer chains galore. Everyone is praying 
And I just keep thinking to myself, like, God, what are you doing with this story? What is this going to look like? How are you going to redeem it? How are you going to fix it? And I'm ready for his, like, big monumental, miraculous moment where he makes all things new and he fixes all the problems. And we're able to go back to the life that we were living. And so I find this place, and it's $40,000 for a month of treatment. And I remember someone telling me one time, they said, Chris, I I just want to make sure this is covered by your insurance. And I was like, Gary... Who cares about insurance, man? Like $40,000 is a really small price to pay if I'm gonna get my wife back. I don't care. If this is the best one that there is, then this is where we're taking her. So we take a plane, we go over there. I drop her off at the facility. And I remember driving back to the airport to fly back home, to be with all the babies, to get ready for her every day to call and to talk to me about what she's been doing in therapy that day. And But I remember thinking to myself, like, I finally get it, you know, like I... I finally get what God's doing. Like he's, he's probably trying to bring an element of understanding to the local church about the power of mental illness and it's, it's, it's stigmatized in the church and so maybe, maybe this is what's gonna happen. He needed to take us to such a low point of psychosis and, and, and these moments that were just erratic in order that one day when Paige gets well through this facility, I'm gonna be able to stand with my wife and talk about the power of God's miraculous healing hand in the face of mental illness and, div- and, and adversity and, and pain and brokenness and, and sickness and that my wife and I are gonna be advocates for this and shed light on something, a taboo in the local church. And as a pastor, I get to stand there and say, I watched her firsthand. It's, she wasn't like smoking crack or anything. It's just, it's, her brain just went wrong. She didn't sleep and her brain just betrayed her and I watched it happen. I had a front row seat to psychosis right in front of me from a woman who never struggled with any of those things. And I started to get excited about how God's redeeming the story. I started to get really excited about how God's gonna change things and morph things and alter things so that we could be this family that demonstrated the goodness of God. Eight days into her stay, she killed herself. And then as a Christian, and as a pastor, you gotta process things like this. Like church is easy when everything is good. Like worshiping God is easy when you consistently see things coming through in the way that you wanted to. But do you have any clue how hard it is to sing a song like you're a good, good father when your wife kills herself? There's a moment that happens in the life of every Christian individual and that you'll have to face too when you say, do I follow this God because it's convenient and because I gotta follow something and you put that little cross, your Instagram bio as as some sort of way of identifying yourself to the culture. But when when everything happens, when, when life, when the storm hits and when life hits, what are you actually made of? When everything goes wrong, and friend, I just gotta tell you, some of you know because you've already been through this, But life's coming. And the storm is coming. And when crap hits the fan in your life and everything goes sideways and it seems like God is absent, you'll have a real honest conversation that you're gonna have, which is, God, are you actually the God of my life or are you, or are you just some sort of fictitious, high and mighty, I'm gonna make a nod to you, I'm willing to go to future quests, that seems like a good idea, but I'm really here for the ladies, this is, this is really what my heart is all about, and as soon as something better than Jesus comes along, I'm gonna jump ship. Or, as I get older, I recognize that I wanna live life my own way, and if the Bible talks about this is the way that I'm supposed to practice my sexuality, and this is the way that I'm supposed to honor him, then I'm out. I am my own God, I am my own king. These are the questions that you'll have to ask in your life. And if you've had the privilege up to this point in your life to not have that dramatic moment where you decide, is God who you actually follow or is he just part of your religious weekend program? It's coming for you. And three out of the four of you sitting in here will not follow Jesus after you go to college. And here's the issue. When I say three out of the four of you, if you group up right now mentally into groups of four and you think to yourself, only one of us is going to make it, here's the problem. The person sitting next to you thinks it's them too. 
Three out of the four of you will not make it, and the person sitting next to you and you're part of their group thinks it's going to be them and not you. Which one of you is right? The Bible says again and again, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. If you think that you're going to walk through adolescence into adulthood and have this kind of out there weekend experience, I'm just going to go to Future Quest once a year and make my nod to God on Christmas and Easter and that you're going to finish this life in Christ, someone has deceived you. If you think you're going to walk through this life without pain or brokenness or hurt or questions or doubts about God and that it's going to be some sort of proverbial yellow brick road until you die and meet God face to face, someone's deceived you. And honestly, it's probably you who's deceived you. And whether you're the hyper-Christian homeschooled kid who has every verse memorized, it doesn't matter because on the day when everything falls apart, you still have to ask the question, do I know God here or do I know him here? Do I know a lot about God or do I truly know God? These are the questions you have to ask. And I think this story that I want to present to you today, just, this is just the opening conversation of a whole three days worth of conversations, and I've been looking at who else is teaching here, and I can tell you one thing. I, I, one of my pet peeves in life is when you, who are your age, gets treated like children. I just hate it. I can't stand it. I, I hated being y'all's age and going to camp and everyone being like, we should pray more. We should read the Bible more. We should do this. Maybe those things are true but I felt like I watched people stand up in front of me who were going through the real stuff of life and the real pain and the real questions, and yet they didn't treat me like adults. They, like, they, they watered down the Bible and they made it much easier for, for me to not get offended by things. I just, I'm not interested in not offending you. I'm not interested in treating you like children and I'm not interested in watering down or sugarcoating something. I want you to get who Jesus is and most of you don't know who he is because you've bought into some cultural understanding, stereotypical idea that Jesus is just this groovy, hippie, lamb-holding, rainbow-sprouting dude that's just chill with whatever you're doing, and as long as you and him are kosher, and as long as you're happy, he's sitting there going, that's great. You think you're doing him a favor by going to church on the weekend, and you've got the wrong God entirely. And the Christian belief system is this, that you are not your body. You are a soul. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. And on the day that you close your eyes in death, there is nothing for us in our world to ever reasonably believe that the soul that you inhabit, right? When you say, someone hurt my feelings or someone hurt me, even seeing my wife for the first time, her dead, lifeless body, I never went, look, it's Paige. Because that wasn't her. Right? We, we literally have word for that. If you see that, you go, those are Paige's remains. That's Paige's body. But no one makes the argument, there's Paige there on the floor. Why? Because you and I are not our body. We are something different. We care about justice. We care about things that are bigger than ourselves. We, we talk about peace. We, we want things that nothing else in the animal kingdom wants, right? We, if, you, if, if in the animal kingdom, you watch a dog or a lion or a great white shark go and try to mate with a, with a female that doesn't want to, we record it on video and some British guy goes, ah, oh, the great white shark looks to forcibly copulate with the female. And we're like, oh, interesting, animal planet, I love it. <laughs> I love sharks. Shark behavior is interesting. We should have a whole week dedicated to them. They're fantastic. None of y'all ever put a shark on trial, right? None of y'all were like, Where, who's going to catch that shark? That, that female shark did not want that. that. No, we're like, oh, it's nature. I love nature. <laughs> and yet we cry foul when someone in our species would ever think ever about forcing themselves on someone that didn't want it. Why? Because you're not a shark, and you're not a monkey, and you're, not, you're different, you're wholly entirely different. And culture has no reason outside of God to understand why you're different. Because you're smarter? Because No, it's because the book of Genesis says, God breathed a soul into you that he breathed into no other creature. That's why you care about justice. 
That's why you care about mercy. That's why you care about love. That's why you care about God-like things because God breathed his own breath into you. There's something different about you. And we believe that the soul that you have, the soul that you are, when the body that you have dies, your soul is gonna meet your creator face to face one day. And in that moment, when you see him face to face, he is either gonna know you as a child, come near to me, good and faithful servant, he calls us children of God, or he's gonna know us as enemy. There's not, there's not 47 categories. There's only two. On the day where we meet God face to face, we either understand him as father and we are his kid or enemy and he says, away from me. That's it. Culture doesn't like this, but I told you I'm not interested in not offending you. I'm not interested in it. I've got more degrees than a thermometer in this book and I'm not gonna come here and pretend like I don't understand what it's saying. This is what the text says. And this is what Jesus tries to get out here in the book of Mark chapter 10. Here's what it says. It's it's so interesting to look at scripture where we get to watch Jesus interact. Do you wanna know why? Because the Bible says that the fullness of God's character rests in bodily form. He is the character in the New Testament. The Greek word means he is the perfect image of God. Okay, So if you wanna know what God's like, you don't need to read the whole Bible to do so. You can, it might be helpful, but the Bible says that Jesus is the icon image. He is a Xerox copy of the character of God. Do you wanna know what God's like? Look at Jesus, here's what it says. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This character in scripture, we'll find out later, is a rich, young ruler, okay? In our culture, If you had the choice between being rich and poor as far as acumen, dignity, value goes, you'd rather be rich than poor. Am I right? Yes. Young, if you had the choice in our culture between discovering the fountain of youth or the fountain of old age, we would rather have the fountain of youth. We want to be younger. We want to be richer. We want to be younger. We want to be more powerful. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. Jesus meets this man who's a rich young ruler, and in their culture, very patriarchal, it would be better to be a man than a woman. Women were of less value in this culture, which is why Jesus, again and again, asserts that women, just like he made man, are of equal value. That was absolutely inappropriate in this culture, and Jesus doesn't care. Jesus announces that he's God of the universe for the first time to a Samaritan woman. Who finds the tomb empty? Women do. Who does he consistently accommodate and lift up? Women, over and over and over. Jesus doesn't care about cultural norms. And so here comes this rich young ruler. And here's what it says. He falls on his knees before Jesus and he says, good teacher, how do I get to heaven? It's an important question. So far, we've got, we've got the right posture, right? If you ever meet God face to face, you should just drop to, face down in the floor like, oh, geez, you're God and I'm not. You are great and I'm nothing. I'm depraved and you're perfect. And then he calls him good teacher. That word good in the original language means perfect, okay? So in the history of humanity, how many people have ever been perfect? Just the one. And his name is Jesus, okay? That was 10 points for Gryffindor. His name is Jesus. Now, Jesus responds with this question then. Jesus, who is God himself, God in a bod, says, hold on, hold on. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus isn't saying, well, I'm Jesus, I'm not God. No, he's looking at the rich young ruler and he's saying, excuse me, did you just call me God? Because if I'm your God, then everything I say goes. But if I'm just some teacher, then I'm gonna give you my opinion and you're gonna do whatever you want. So he starts by saying, okay, rich young ruler, let's get one thing clear. Am I your God or am I just some wise sage? Am I just some cultural figure, some, some helpful, uh, nuanced instructor of your life. Which one am I? The rich young ruler responds in verse 20, teacher. Okay, 
What did the rich young ruler do? He took out the word good, he took out the word perfect, and now he's going, yeah, I'm not so sure you're the God of my life. I'm not so sure you're God in the flesh. Let's just use the term teacher. So he takes out the word good. Jesus says, if you want to inherit eternal life, here's what you got to do. You have to keep all the commandments, 613 Old Testament laws, including do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, don't defraud, honor your father and mother. The rich young ruler interrupts and says, no, 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 I've done all that. The rich young ruler says, no, 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 I'm perfect. I, I've never done anything wrong. To which Jesus, who the book of John chapter three says, knows all things perfectly, looks at the rich young ruler and thinks to himself, what? Like, are you high? You, you want to tell me that you've been alive for, as a rich young ruler, you've never committed this sin of lust? You've never hated someone in your heart? You've never said anything untrue ever? And the rich young ruler stands by his statement. Yes, I'm perfect. Teacher, he declared, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. And I love this phrase right here. Verse 21 says this. Jesus looked at him. Okay, he gives him the time of day, even though this guy's massively whack, right? He's off. That would be a dude walking up here like a, someone would in my position. If you have a pastor at this conference that walks up and goes, you fools, you sinners, I see you up there sending your little hearts out. I wish you were more like me because I don't do anything wrong ever. I am the perfect pastor. I'm the perfect teacher. I'm the one that you should look up to. I'm not just a perfect communicator. I'm a perfect being. I've never made a mistake. I promise you, friends, that's not what I'm telling you. I am Chris Hilkin, and I'm a dumpster fire, okay? (laughs) Like, I'm like a dumpster fire on fire, I guess. I guess that's kind of given in to what I said about dumpster fire. But it doesn't matter, right? We're messed up people. You're not going to hear a breakout or a main session from anyone who isn't horribly messed up and deeply sinful. You're not going to do it. They don't exist. Unless Jesus is teaching a breakout, in which case, don't come to my breakout, go to his. Because I'm going to his too. I don't even have a breakout. All these things I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus had every right in this moment to go, mm, snake, and just turn the man into a snake. Or be like, eh, lightning bolt, boom. He could do whatever he wants. The universe is his, Psalm 24. Everything in it belongs to him. He knows people's thoughts in the scripture. He tells winds to knock it off and they obey in the scripture. He brings himself back from the dead. Jesus has all things at his disposal. And yet, here's the character of Jesus, not just for this man, but for you. It says this. It says, he looked at the man in his misunderstanding and in his pride of thinking, I don't need God. It says, Jesus looked at him and then I love this phrase, and then he loved him Some of y'all never understood this about God, that God sees you, that God loves you, and then it says, Jesus responds by saying, one thing you're missing. Don't you love how Jesus' love is connected to hard truth? Jesus looked at the man and loved him and said, nice shoes. Jesus looked at the man and loved him and said, you know what, if you think you're perfect, then you're perfect. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says, and then Jesus looked at the man and loved him and said, you're missing the main point of why you exist. You're missing all of it. I don't care if you're a rich, young ruler. You're a rich, young ruler for 70 years here. You've got hundreds of trillions of years in eternity to live, and your, your brain is so wrapped up on temporary things, you're missing the whole point of why you're here. One thing you lack, Jesus says. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor. You're gonna have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Now, this is not a universal mandate for all Christians, right? Like if you have clothes and shoes and food at home, God isn't telling each one of us to go sell everything we have if we're gonna follow Jesus, no. Why does he tell the rich young ruler this? Because this was the rich young ruler's God. The thing of most importance to the rich young ruler was money. So Jesus simply says, you got to get rid of your idol before you're ready to follow me. 
This is what he's telling to each and every one of us. There is something in your life that is supreme to Jesus. There's something in the heart of everyone before they follow Jesus that is more important than God. For some of you, it's the way you look. For some of you, it's who follows you. For some of you, it's friendships. For some of you, it's relationships. For some of you, it's sex. For some of you, it's success. For some of you, it's college. For some of you, it's money. I don't know what it is. For this man, it was finances. So Jesus says, get rid of those and then follow me. I, my idol isn't finances. So if God walked into my life right now and Jesus stood before me and I fell on my knees and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wouldn't say, go sell everything you have and follow me. He might tell me who my obsession can be safety for my family now. After your wife kills herself with absolutely no explanation at the, at the onset of things and falls into destruction right in front of your eyes, you wonder what I'm scared of? That it's gonna happen to other people that I love. And so I can find myself praying prayers like, God, I'll follow you if you keep my family safe, which means that my idol is no longer, my God is no longer God, it's safety, it's protection. This is how I err. This is the idol of my heart. I guess my question to you is this. The man responds, it says verse 22, at this the rich young ruler's face was downcast. He went away sad because he had great wealth that he wasn't ready to let go of. I want to end with this truth. The rich young ruler did the right thing. He fell on his knees before Jesus. The rich young ruler said the right thing. Good teacher. He even asked the right thing. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But there was something that he was holding on to. There was a doubt. There was an insecurity. There was an idol. There was something keeping him away from Jesus. And Jesus goes right for the jugular. He says, I want to talk about the very thing that you don't want to talk about. I really believe that this is the call of the beginning of Future Quest 2023. The question I want to leave you with is simple. If Jesus stood in front of your chair as you sit right now, if the rest of this place was empty... Don't worry about your friends. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about the person sitting in front of you. If, if in this room right now, there was a spotlight right here, you came and stood where I'm standing, and the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, walked in and looked at you in the eye, and you said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What would he respond? Because here's what he would do. He would look at you, and he would love you enough to say, you know what I know, friend. And insert your name in the blank. You know what I know. When it comes to me, you don't even know that I'm real. Jesus would say to some of us, you know what I know. Your heart is so hurt by the things that have happened to you by religious people that you don't want anything to do with me in the first place. And I want to talk about that. For some of us, we would stand here and Jesus would say, I love you enough to tell you that your addiction to the thing that you're looking at on the internet or your addiction to the way that, you, that people perceive you or your addiction to the way that you are looked at and perceived by culture is so crazy that you don't have any space in your heart for the God of the universe because you're obsessed with the scorecards of everyone around you all the time. I don't know what he would say to you, but I want to start the conference by asking you a simple question. I want you to role play this moment in your head and I, you got to be honest with yourself and you got to be able to say hard things like maybe for some of you, you would look at Jesus and you would stop him halfway down the aisle and you would say, I hate you. I don't want to talk to you. I hate what you stand for. I hate what you've done to my family. I hate what you've done to me. And you know what? That might be the first time you've been honest in your whole life. And God's not afraid of your doubt. He's not afraid of your skepticism. He welcomes it openly. But I just don't think you're interested in a church conference that's gonna walk around and high five you and go, are you good? I'm good, we're good, he's good, let's go, we're good. Just don't, like you, <laughs> don't sign up for that crap anymore, man. There's hard life stuff that needs to happen in this room, okay? I'm not gonna treat you like your kids. I'm gonna talk to you like you're adults. 
You need to ask the deeper questions of life now or you're going to wake up and you're going to be 60 and you're going to realize you've wasted your life because you don't even know what you're here for. And I hope none of you lose your wife to suicide. None of you lose your husband to suicide. I hope you never have to face the reality of losing a kid or losing someone close to you. But the truth is, some of you already have. You've already lived your worst day. You're already mad at God. You're already confused on this whole Jesus thing. And Jesus is here for the real moments of life, even though we want to relegate him just to the worshipy Sunday morning experiences where the lights and the sounds are all going, and he's not. He's there for the weeping and the mourning and the crushing and the breaking and the pain and the anguish and the doubts. And if Jesus walked in front of your seat right now and you said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What would his response be? One thing you lack. There's one thing separating you and I in this moment. And the beauty of the grace of Jesus is that it's not your job to get to heaven. Jesus' cross signifies that God spanned the gap of eternity and time and your sinfulness in order to get to you. That's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that, but I want to start by just asking that question in conclusion today. What I'm going to ask you to do is this. You don't have to. I, like Some of you just... you're. I'm not going to get you to do anything, okay? I'm not going to try to, you're bigger than this, you're better than that, you're too cool for this. I get it. I understand. For those of you who are willing to, who want to actually engage in a conversation like this, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to think of a question. For me, I would write it down in my notes on my phone or write it down in your journal, notebook, whatever it is. What do you think if you were confronted by Jesus and you said, Jesus, look at my life. Exposed to you everything that I have from the way that I think to the way that I act to what I do behind closed doors. If you were to walk in front of me, Jesus, what would you say that I need to get out of my life or that I need to begin in order to know you and to spend eternal life with you? What does that look like? I want you to guess what he would say. I want you just to guess. Knowing yourself, if you're willing to be honest with yourself, if Jesus Christ confronted you in this moment and said one thing you you lack, if you want to know what it means to follow me, you must, what would it be? Is it the end of a relationship? Is it the end of an addiction? Is it the exposing of a hurt that you have? Is it a doubt that you carry with you about who God is and if he exists? What would it be? Because you can have your hands high in worship and you can raise your voice loud in worship and you can bend your knee deep in worship, but if you have something in your life that's separating you from God, God is disinterested in the cardboard cutout fake version of yourself that you send to church every Sunday. He just doesn't care about it. God's interested in the hurt, in the pain, in the brokenness, the reality of who you are. And I want you to know a Jesus who's comfortable with that because that's the Jesus that I've met through all the brokenness of experiencing this with my wife. I met a Jesus that I never knew before, a Jesus that cares about those things in my life, a Jesus that was there in the mourning and the pressing and the crushing and the brokenness, one that moved towards me when I was broken. He didn't wait for me to get better. He came to me in that pain. Do you want to know what my biggest question was? God, if you're actually there, there's no way that you could be a good God and let my life look like this. I still struggle with that. I'm not over it. I struggle with the goodness of God on how he would let something like that happen in my life. But I worship him in spite of it. But I follow him and sometimes even because of it. And I found a Jesus that is more beautiful and more powerful and more present than ever before, even in the midst of my darkest valley. So I ask you this question. If Jesus came to you, what would he say? Would you pray with me? God, as we, as we open up this conference, as we start asking these questions, as we start exposing the doubts, the lies, the fears, the insecurities, I know for some of us, it's just not gonna be something that we wanna engage in. We're, we're either not ready for it. Mentally, we're not ready for it as far as maturity, we just, we're just not ready for this conversation. And God, I would, just, I, would, I would pray that you would move the hearts of those who are into a position of saying, 
I'm ready to have these adult conversations and these adult questions and get him some adult answers. I've been, I've been coasting on my parents' faith for way too long. It's time to make it my own. And I want to know if I believe this. I want to know if I'm into this. I want to know if, am I going to be a Christ follower or am I just a Christ follower because my parents were Christ followers? God, would you create a crisis of faith for everyone in here at this moment to ask the question, am I actually a follower of Jesus or have I just never really asked these questions before? And God, maybe some of us were so opposed to you, would you just soften our heart enough to ask these more difficult questions? God, thanks for the power of a team that's putting on Future Quest that invites these conversations to happen for every leader, for every pastor, for every worship leader, for every counselor, for every small group leader represented in this place who is here for one and only one reason, to engage in conversations that will make eternal differences. That is why we're here. It's in your name we pray. Amen.